10 years ago, uh, I'd be at a party, and people had asked me what I do, and I'd say, uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, and then they'd go off to the kitchen and have a drink. <laughs> Tumbleweed would come down. But um, nowadays, it's quite different. When I say, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I used to work at CERN, people are like, oh, that's really cool, and uh, that's amazing. <laughs> but uh, what they were thinking of was they were, 10 years ago, those people I was speaking to were thinking back to their physics class when they were sitting uh, bored like this, uh, this guy here. But, you know, it's really different for me. Every day at work, uh, I get to visit a wonderland, a fairy tale wonderland. I get to travel to the really big and the infinitesimally small, and I really feel like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> so today, I want you to come on a journey with me uh, to this fairy tale wonderland. And as with all good fairy stories, we're going to start with a mystery. So this is um, a computer simulation of a galaxy much like our own. Each of these white dots is a sun or a star, just like our sun, and they rotate around uh, the center of mass. When we look at other galaxies, um, as well as our own, something about this doesn't add up, something quite fundamental. And it's the speeds at which these stars rotate around the center. We use um, maths and uh, Einsteinian gravity, very well-defined uh, equations to describe the motion. And what we see is that the stars around the outside, when we look out, are going too fast. So this is a conundrum. We can predict very well um, how fast the stars should be going. Um, and uh, it depends on uh, the mass of the, visible, of the stuff that we can see but we can estimate that well enough. So could it be that gravity is wrong? But the, the problem is, you know, in the solar system, we describe the motion of the planets really well. We can predict what's going to happen in the future and in the past really well with the motion of the planets. Elsewhere, our theory of gravity works fine. So it's probably not gravity that's uh, giving us a problem here. What we think might be going on is that there's some extra stuff surrounding the galaxy um, in a halo and that stuff uh, would have to be transparent to light because we can't see it. So it's um, dark against the nighttime sky, and that's why it's called dark matter. So the dark matter mystery is, what is this stuff? So, um, and how does it behave? So what you should, um, why should you care about what this stuff is? Well, each and every one of you, remember, our sun is one of these dots in our galaxy, so we're traveling through this dark matter. So each and every one of you has 20 kilograms of it in you right now. Not only that, there's a hurricane of it going through you at 400 kilometers an hour. So you should be looking at me uh, saying, OK, his uh, hovercraft's full of eels. <laughs> He's crazy, right? Um, but because uh, you don't feel it. But of course, you know, most of us um, is space. We're, we're little particles, <laughs> you know, um, with massive space in between uh, the particles. But, of course, I can't put my hand through the floor because um, those particles are held together by forces. So we're, like, we're more like a sieve, and the floor's like a sieve, and I can't put my hand through the, through the floor. But the dark matter doesn't even see the sieve. It goes straight through it. And, in fact, most of the dark matter would go straight through um, the Earth without, uh, without noticing it. So where are we going to go next on this journey to try and answer this dark matter mystery? Um, well, we're going to go down to the very small, down the rabbit hole. So we're going to shrink ourselves, and if we shrink ourselves down to one centimeter, we meet this guy um, who's looking uh, like he's hungry and wants to eat us. So we um, shrink ourselves further down to a millimeter, and at a millimeter we could see the cool uh, compound eye of the fly. If we shrink ourselves down to a hundredth of a millimeter, we'd be able to see the bristles in between the compound segments uh, of the fly, fly's eye. And further, if we go down to a millionth of a millimeter, we'd be able to see the strands of DNA in the bristles uh, of the fly's eye. So each of these spheres uh, around the helical structures um, represents uh, an atom. And if I zoom in on that, a 10 millionth of a millimeter, I could uh, see an atom. So this is just a picture of one. They obviously don't really have faces on them. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that particle that I've drawn a face on, that guy is a proton. 
and uh, one of his brothers or sisters is going to help us answer uh, our mystery. So what I want to do is tell you the life story of a proton. So to do that, what I need to do is to go back to one second after the beginning of time, um, just during the Big Bang era. So at this stage, everything we see now in our observable universe would fit in the atmosphere of the Earth above Hungary. That's amazing, right? So all the stars, all the planets and everything, they'd fit in that space. So of course, they don't exist when you scrunch them up like that as uh, separate stars. They're separate particles all banging against each other, and uh, it's an extremely hot gas of particles. At exactly one second, if we just freeze the universe for a second, um, the, uh, there are no protons yet. There are just smaller particles. As the universe expands at pretty much the speed of light, it cools down. The space in between the particles gets bigger, and eventually, three of them stick together in the primordial soup. Um, and the, these three form our uh, friend, the proton, uh, that we're going to follow through the universe. So um, now uh, the video that you saw at the start of today comes into play. Stuff st tends to stick together. Um, it attracts itself by gravity. You get gas forming. Um, stars are made in, in these uh, stellar nurseries. And then the stars uh, collect together and form galaxies, and we get planets and so on. And of course, with the Milky Way forms and the Earth, and lots of boring stuff happens on Earth, like evolution and civilization, um, and the invention of uh, Belgium and Jan and people called Benjamin and stuff like that. So, uh, but one, so one in very interesting thing happens, and that's that uh, a bunch of uh, physicists uh, get together and they build a lab um, just outside Geneva, and it's the biggest. Um, science experiment uh, of any kind to date, I believe. Certainly the biggest machine. Um, so here it is, that's uh, Lac Le Mans, that moustache-shaped uh, lake. And uh, CERN lies sort of somewhere just outside Geneva on the Franco-Swiss border, um, just near the airport. And um, the accelerator where we send the protons around is 100 meters under the Earth, and it's uh, under this uh, white circle that I've, that I've drawn. So our story starts 100 meters down under the Earth, and our proton that we've been following ends up in this red bottle here, uh, along with you know, billions of his friends. We want to answer this dark matter mystery and find out more about dark matter and how it behaves. Um, how are we going to use the proton to do that? The proton's amazing. He's a cosmic survivor. He was born one second after the beginning of time. He's seen the formation of the stars and the planets and the galaxies and hairdressers, and um, you know, how are we going to use him? We're going to kill him, okay? So what we're going to do is open the valve at the top of the uh, red bottle, and we're going to suck him out into a tube, and then we're going to zoom him along with about a billion of his friends along a pipe with um, electric fields. We focus the beam with magnetic fields. We then spin him up in a big ring, um, to 99.9999% of the speed of light, huge energies, and uh, he goes around, whoops, between France and, and Switzerland 13,000 times a second. We cross the beams, um, sort of at a couple of places around the ring, and of course, these protons uh, are actually tiny, so when we cross the beams, um, they, most of the time, our proton just goes straight past the other ones without hitting them, but after a few hours, chances are, our proton will slam into another one and um, basically, bang, they uh, annihilate into a thousand fiery fragments, and we built a detector around it to uh, measure what comes off. So what we need to do is um, do some detective work and uh, kind of work backwards from these fiery fragments and try and work out what was going on just after the protons uh, collided. So that machine that we build around the collision point, that basically acts as a three-dimensional digital camera. It measures the positions of the, these fiery remnants very precisely and other properties like um, energy and, and stuff. And so what I want to do now is just show you uh, one of the collisions that happened in 2011. Okay, there are billions of these collisions, but um, this one uh, was, happened on the 23rd of April, about 6.30 in the morning. We see the blue protons come in, 
they hit each other, and we get a bunch of tracks. But the important um, tracks that come out are these orange ones. They were particles of light with a lot of energy. And this is precisely what you would expect from the production of a Higgs boson, which then decays into two particles of light. Higgs bosons only decay into uh, light one out of every thousand times, um, but it's the main signal uh, by which you, you look for them. And in fact, it's the main one by which they were um, discovered. I'm sure a lot of you have heard uh, about the Higgs boson uh, already, but um, I'm not sure everyone knows really what the Higgs is good for. And it is a crucial and final piece in a, in a jigsaw puzzle. And the jigsaw puzzle that it solves is mass. Why do our subatomic particles have, have mass? So, you know, we all feel heavy, or at least I feel heavy after the breakfast I've had. And um, it seems odd that particle physicists didn't understand this fact. We, we understood very well how all these interactions worked, um, but, we, but the equations told us our particles had to be massless before Peter Higgs came along with this theory. And uh, then, then we realized that his theory explained the mass of our particles, and the signal that his theory was right is this particle, the Higgs boson. So um, it completes this jigsaw puzzle. But of course, whenever you get an answer in science, it always raises 10 questions, and then we all run off and try and answer all of these 10 questions and have fun doing that. And so this jigsaw puzzle is just one piece in a much larger um, jigsaw puzzle. But OK, so I couldn't resist telling you about the Higgs. But really, I want to get back to dark matter, which is an un quite probably unrelated uh, question. Um, a lot of people had the impression that the Large Hadron Collider was only there to discover the Higgs boson. But it's doing thousands of different searches. And one I've worked on is this search for uh, a dark matter particle. So what we want to do is turn the energy of the proton beams into dark matter particles and try and produce them in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and I've been working on how to sift the data and how to interpret what comes out in terms of um, the dark matter models and models of the early universe. So what we see here is um, a cartoon of one of these 3D digital cameras. I've cut away the front bit um, so you can see what's going on inside. These two dots at the bottom are standard European-sized people. So you can see this thing's really huge. It's, um, it's 40 meters uh, tall. These red arrows coming in from either side there, um, they're the proton beams. And the green arrows coming out the bottom, they would be the fiery fragments of the stuff that we see. And so if we see a collision like this, then what we infer is that something invisible has gone off in the opposite direction. And of course, that black arrow represents the something invisible. And dark matter is precisely this something invisible. It doesn't interact with the matter in the detector. It just uh, acts like a thief, stealing off momentum in the opposite um, direction. So um, of course, there is another reason uh, why you should care um, exactly how much dark matter is around in the universe. And this kind of measurement would be able to tell us um, tell us that or help w with answering that question. I have to point out, this hasn't been discovered yet. This is something we're looking for. And when the uh, Large Hadron Collider starts up again in two years, um, I hope we'll be, able to, we'll be able to see this. The important thing is what's going to be the future of our universe. There's a critical amount of dark matter. And if you're over this critical amount, the universe is too heavy, and it can't sustain its own weight and it'll collapse under gravity, and we get a big crunch in the far future, um, which would probably be painful if we were still around. <laughs> if there's too little, then the universe will carry on um, expanding forever. And so, you know, what could be more fundamental, telling the entire fate of our universe, uh, I think is an interesting question uh, for all of us. So as scientists, we're, we're really interested in these fundamental questions, but actually, the technology that we uh, invent to try and answer these questions affects human lives um, as well in more, much more direct ways. So now I'm gonna, just going to um, give you one example of an application that's got nothing to do with the Higgs boson or dark matter, but it has 
uh, got to do with the technology that we've invented to make these proton beams. So what you do is you um, take one of the beams in one direction, and you make a very small LHC. And there are now several of these in hospitals around the world. It fits in a large room, this proton accelerator. And you skim some of the protons off and uh, fire them at um, deep tumors within certain cancer patients. And this can help to treat cancer with less side effects um, than some of the other treat treatments in some cases. So you see that um, you know, these, this technology that we invented to study the really tiny and the unimaginably large is actually relevant for organisms that are somewhere in between those two distant scales us. So what I want to just finish on is, is this. The Large Hadron Collider has now shut down for two years. And uh, that's because they're upgrading um, the machine. They want to start again at about double the energy that they had before, make more discoveries, hopefully. But that's an opportunity for all of you. If you're ever going to be in Geneva, I really recommend that a few weeks before, you contact CERN and you ask for a guided tour. CERN, CERN gives about, uh, I don't know, 20 guided tours to people a day. They're really keen to take people down. Because the beam's not on, that means you can actually go down in a lift, look around the detectors, and uh, you know, you'll have physicists, working physicists, take you around and explain stuff to you, and uh, I recommend it. It's an amazing ride. Thank you. Thank you.